Peter, I'm very, very happy to be, to be back here. It's a couple of years since uh, I spoke at the Institute and uh, I, I find myself still back in the, uh, in the Western Balkans in particular. Um, I'm now working on an EC financed uh, project which is managed by uh, PM Group uh, of, of Dublin uh, or Ireland. And so I've managed to find myself working in the Western Balkans but being continually employed by the Irish because previously I was uh, under Irish aid and now I'm with, uh, with PM Group. But, uh, and I'll explain a little bit uh, about later about uh, the office where I'm working and, and what we're doing. But uh, Peter has painted um, a rather uh, gloomy picture of the economic outlook uh, in the Western Balkans. And in fact, uh, we, when we were in Brussels together in November, it was even slightly more optimistic. He revised the growth forecasts uh, down. And what I wanted to talk about today was that there is, there is um, increasingly, and I think it will get stronger now, a realisation on all parties that there really is a need for much better coordination of the official assistance that's going into the Western Balkans. Now, we've been saying this for years, uh, you know, better coordinated assistance, be it from the international financial institutions or from bilateral donors. But as I can testify from my time in the Stability Pact, getting coordination among international actors is no easy feat. Um, but there has been um, a sustained uh, effort, particularly by the European Commission, uh, in DG enlargement. And uh, one of the things I will talk today about is this Western Balkan investment framework. Um, so I just will quickly go through uh, the Western Balkan investment framework, a little bit about what our office is doing, and maybe just give you some, uh, you may have heard some of this from Anne Barrington. I couldn't access the video, so I couldn't check. Um, but um, what the EC is looking at in terms of the future assistance, its instrument for pre-accession in the 2014-2020 uh, scenario. So one of the, um, the kind of uh, incentives for the EC to really try and move to get better coordination between its assistance programs and particularly those of the international financial institutions is the huge need for uh, investment in the region, particularly capital investment, but also investment in softer sectors, the social sector, uh, for example. And um, what we have is, as Peter said, we've had uh, foreign direct investment has to some extent fallen off a cliff in the region, not, not surprisingly, obviously the crisis being a major driver, but you also had the completion of the pri privatisation process, or certainly the best of the privatisation, and uh, a lot of what's left now need, certainly needs some loving care, maybe before it, it can go to the, to the market. But this, this region really lags behind, and when you compare it with the new member states, it still really lags behind in terms of capital in investment in particular, if you look at transport, energy, um, th those kind of areas, which are crucial for economic growth and also for social uh, aspects. And so the other issue we have in the region is that over the last uh, few years, the bilateral donors are, are pulling out. Um, you know, they've moved on to, to other areas, uh, and now with the Arab Spring, uh, this again, this this region risks uh, losing even more uh, attention as there's less money available and other places uh, for it to go. Even our friends in the EBRD are now focusing on on North Africa. Their mandate has been extended. So in DG enlargement, they they really find that they are one of the last major suppliers of grant assistance. And so what they uh, have been in, were in discussions with the IFIs as to how to better blend the grants with the loans to try and expedite some of the investments because one of the problems we have in the region is even though projects have been planned for years they're not actually moving ahead if you look at the pace of development it is it is quite slow so you can see there's there's a whole lot of issues that that need to be uh, taken into account uh, when trying to do this and um, what they've come up with is as i said what's called the western balkan investment uh, framework which aims to coordinate um, better the support from the EC, the IFIs and the donors uh, into the region to try and focus, identify and focus what are the priority investments that need to be funded uh, and that need to be expedited uh, along the way, to have these uh, in line with the overall accession pathway, to have these in line with national <coughs> strategies, but also to keep in mind the regional perspective, which uh, <coughs> is something is incredibly important. This is a very small region. Uh, you have very small populations in general and extremely uh, interconnected and also it's an extremely important region also for the EU in terms of transit uh, and transport if you look at energy supply, if you look at uh, transport down to, uh, to and from major markets. 
And so it was uh, agreed that under this Western Balkan investment framework, priority would be given to those projects that had the greatest regional impact. But of course, sometimes in some areas that's rather difficult. It's maybe easy with a major highway connecting several capital cities, but it's not so easy in the case of environment. Uh, if you're doing water, wastewater treatment plants, you know, proving the regional impact um, of that. So what the WBIF does is it provides EC grants which can help either prepare loans to do all to for grant funding to do all that kind of feasibility studies, technical assessments, environmental impact assessments, etc., that are needed to prepare a loan, or it can also accompany the loan when the loan is in place and construction is underway. Because as you know, it's an ongoing story of the administrative uh, capacity in the region, administrative weaknesses, and there is uh, still a significant need to help with that. And you still also have huge weaknesses in the reform process in the region. In fact, uh, the reform process uh, before the crisis had actually really started to slow up somewhat uh, as foreign direct investment was pouring in and there seemed to be maybe less incentive to go and push through some of the rather painful economic reforms that, that were needed. Um, the Western Balkan Investment Framework covers all of the, the Western Balkans. I have Kosovo here under UNSCR 1244. I'm waiting for official sanction to replace uh, that with the with the asterisks. Um, I hope to do that uh, shortly. Um, so, and I wanted this. It's actually devised as a partnership approach with the countries of the region, which uh, was the subject of, of many discussions because the EC very much with its EPA program has a large consultation process with the countries and tries to work with them to agree on a common program. That's not necessarily the case with some of the uh, international financial institutions uh, or yeah, sometimes even bilateral donors. But the Commission is involved, DG Enlargement at the helm, but they've also bringing into this, um, again trying to coordinate within one rather large institution, the so-called line DGs, like DG Move, uh, which is Mobility and Transport, DG Energy, uh, DG Environment, uh, increasingly probably DG Klima, because the Western Balkans are going to be one of the areas in Europe most badly affected by climate change, and also DG Employment, uh, Inclusion and Social Issues. The IFIs, at the outset in late 2009, it uh, was the so-called European IFIs, the Council of Europe Development Bank, which mainly has a social mandate, the EBRD, the European Investment Bank. But uh, since last June, um, we've had the World Bank has come on board as uh, an associate member. Um, it cannot be lead financier in many of the countries except for Kosovo, because none of the other uh, European IFIs can lend in Kosovo. But I think that's in a very important development, particularly, as I'll talk a bit later, uh, initially when the WBIF was started, the emphasis was on getting projects into the pipeline, getting projects to prepare. But increasingly, as we move on, the strategy, the overall strategies in the different sectors, <coughs> the overall development strategies becomes important and where our office comes in. And clearly, the World Bank is a font of knowledge and expertise uh, for that. And then we also have a lot of bilateral uh, donors. I think some of the bilateral donors are finding this a very useful way to channel their funds because they no longer have the resources to independently manage them. And they also hope that basically they'll get a bigger bang for their buck, so to speak, if they can uh, put it into this common pool. And uh, particularly the Germans, but they also come in as donors, but also with KFW, their uh, development bank. So it has two key components. It um, has grant facilities and you can see there that the EC has put in quite a lot of money into this grant facility. The three European IFIs have put uh, 10 million each into the uh, pot and then what's called the European Western Balkan Joint Fund which is a very uh, large na name, this is where the bilateral donors have pooled their money. It's actually under the management of the EBRD. And then the IFIs have said that they uh, would, if you like, plan to lend somewhere in the region of six billion under the auspices of this facility. Um, what's eligible for the WBIF? Uh, so obviously the Western Balkans, uh, key socioeconomic sectors, so the usual suspects, so to speak, energy, environment, transport, Social infrastructure, although there is a discussion now going on about also that if you like the softer side of social education, healthcare, healthcare financing, pension reform. Um, and private sector development has just been added as of last year. Um, clearly, uh, Peter indicated it there, the fall off in credit, the availability of credit for small and medium sized enterprises. I mean, yes, you could get credit, but you demand 200% collateral and ex uh, interest rates uh, at an enormous rate. 
Um, the beneficiaries, it can be public, private or mixed uh, capital. Um, all else costs uh, are covered, uh, subject to obviously normal e EC rules. Different types of grants, it can be technical assistance, we can give co-financing grants where there's a gap in financing of a project, incentives, insurance premia, and new, as I said, there's now been uh, that some of the WBIF grant money can be used to conduct sectoral studies. So before we can take decisions on project applications, that we have an overview of the sector in the region, uh, overview of the key issues arising and what, in term, what are the strategies. And again, always taking into the mix the accession prospect of all of these countries, uh, as well as uh, regional or international commitments. Um, the applications for this are submitted by the beneficiaries. It's not, it's not the uh, EC or the IFIs saying, you know, here's the project. It's the, um, there's a call for proposals twice a year, and it's the beneficiaries who must uh, submit this. Now, they need the endorsement of an IFI because the project has to be somewhere in the feasible range. Um, but um, they, they submit it, and then um, we have all the, the rules, mainly of the EC, so as I said, there's a number of different uses uh, of the grants, uh, preparatory or implementation phase, and then these sectoral studies, which are literally a new future, a new feature since last year. So twice a year we have the calls for proposals. These must come in through something called the NEPAX, as you know, the European Commission is brilliant for uh, acronyms. These are not some kind of mutant version of Pac-Man, they are national EPA coordinators. Uh, in all of the countries and the idea being there is to try and get coordination within the countries because often you have um, line ministries like transport or energy dealing directly with uh, IFIs or uh, other bilateral donors but this way it's to try and have it every application must come from the line DG through the national EPA coordinator who's also supposed to check it's in line with their overall strategies and also check with their Ministry of Finance, for example, have they ever heard of this project and are they planning uh, to see if, if the loan is foreseen in the medium term expenditure plan. The applications are then screened by our, what's called the Project Financiers Group and this is really comprises the EC, the IFIs and the main uh, donors who would be assessing this for its, its feasibility and also trying to rate them in terms of contribution to regional impact, contribution to implementation of accession um, criteria. Uh, but obviously this is also difficult because each project normally has an IFI associated with it that has said, you know, if this project goes ahead, we are interested in lending. So there's always an element of, of competition there. Um, and then we're trying to have, as I said, this strategic orientation and the decisions are finally made at a steering committee which takes place twice a year at which all the beneficiary countries uh, are involved. And the steering committee also sets the overall strategic approach. For example, at the last steering committee, the issue of energy efficiency was highlighted and, and, and the fact that funding would be uh, oriented towards that in the, in the next round. So since December 2009, uh, there's been 122 grants approved for, for different projects uh, with a value of 186 million. And if every single one of those projects was deemed to be feasible and to go forward, which of course is a big question mark because part of the process is to see if they're feasible, uh, you're looking at a total of 8 billion potential total investment uh, and with approximately 4 billion of loans being under consideration for the region now. Peter has highlighted that the fiscal space in the region is limited, so I think there's going to be even more uh, prioritisation having to take place uh, as these projects move on and we get the feasibility. Just to show you where the grants are going at the moment in terms of where the projects are coming from, in terms of the 186 million, um, the expenditure, you can see environment is taking up a huge amount. This is mainly water, wastewater treatment plants. Um, now, th this is a little bit skewed because there was a particular EC program, Municipal uh, Infrastructure Program, live at the time, so people took advantage of that to come in. So we will see environment, I think, shrink a little bit uh, in the future. Uh, transport, 23%, not surprisingly, and energy, given the huge deficits in the region. Social sector is slowly coming up. Now, I have to say, some, the definition of social sector is a little bit elastic. I think some of the projects are for the building of prisons in Bosnia. So I suppose it is social sector, depending on uh, whether you're highly conservative or very liberal, you can see it as a good thing that there is, uh, the facilities are much better or the people are, are locked up. I'm, I'm being facetious. But, um, so social is a bit of an elastic uh, sector. 
Um, I'm sorry, my, my, the pie charts were done. Lorraine very kindly helped me with those, but my ability to put them into slides is not so good. But um, you can see the countries uh, in terms of the grants by beneficiary. I just want to highlight, you can see Bosnia is on 24%, Albania 23%. The reason Croatia and Macedonia are so small there at 2 and 6% respectively is because at the outset of the Western Balkan Investment Framework, it was not clear that they would be eligible to benefit because as candidate countries, they have access to more EPA funding. The EPA program is divided into five components. As a potential candidate, you have access to component one for institution building, component two for cross-border. But components three, four, and five are basically precursors to cohesion funding and structural funding and CAP. And only Croatia and Macedonia had access to that. So, but it's now been cleared up a bit and they are begin, beginning to become more active. So I think we will see a bigger percentages for them soon. And then um, the countries by total grants. Again, you can see Bosnia uh, has been extremely active, but Serbia has also, not surprisingly, been very active in terms of submitting projects. Um, we've just had the latest call for proposals, the deadline was the 20th of February, got 52 project requests from the countries, um, transport energy becoming very high again, in, uh, environment, uh, social sector and one private sector uh, project. The good thing is that the number of regional projects is increasing, uh, which we're very pleased to see because um, obviously the instinct maybe to some extent is to apply for national projects, but the importance of regional uh, infrastructure I think is uh, beginning to, again, I mean it's been there, but they're beginning to really understand that uh, this is where funds are going to be devoted to. Um, we also have for the first time the applications for sectoral studies. So there's an application, for example, for a big transport sectoral study, which would be good because the last big transport uh, survey that was done in the region was way back at the start, 2002, I remember. It's called the Rebus study, whoever was around. So this will be the first update in basically 10 years on where have, where have the investments in the transport sector been, where are the gaps, and where do we need to go forward. The screening is underway by the Commission. It's gone out to all the Commission line DGs. It's gone to the delegation, and the IFIs are also looking at it. And the final decisions on which of the 52 projects will get a green light uh, will be made uh, in June. Um, and then the work we're doing. Um, our office is a small, small office. Um, we're funded by DG Enlargement because they really recognised that there needs to be better coordination, not just at the project level, but also an overall strategy policy uh, moving forward with the EC, the IFIs, and communicating that with the beneficiaries. Because often, as you know, people tend to commune, commune in silos, and the information flows um, are not uh, necessarily the best. And they also wanted some kind of facility that, that could help with um, improving general communication, but also acting as a very, very mini think tank for the WBIF, issues of the day that were coming up that could be studied. And um, this was an international tender which was awarded to, uh, to PM Group. The kind of things we do, uh, we have the joy of conducting research and analysis, all on a small scale, I hasten to add. Um, preparation of thematic reports. We also do, I think, what you might find a valuable skill. We synthesize a lot of things. And I have one here. Um, we look the whole issue of the whole need for a new growth model in the Western Balkans post, post crisis. That was a was post crisis or maybe ongoing crisis. So we've looked at, uh, one of our uh, experts looked at about 20, 25 different reports from IFIs, from think tanks, from academia, and brought that down and synthesized and brought out some of the common features. And certainly in the commission, they love us for this because it saves them reading 25 uh, reports. But I, I think it, it's, it's, it's a useful uh, thing. We're also, um, we've also tried to look at the impact of the austerity measures on the investment programs in the different countries, trying to see, are the countries cutting back on capital investment? If so, so where are they cutting back? Is there a pattern or are they just kind of slashing where, where they have to? Um, we do a, a lot of organization of sectoral workshops, uh, often on a small scale, trying to bring together the key experts from the IFIs, sometimes, with the, sometimes just the EC and the IFIs together to thrash out some particular problems because you're trying to get big institutions to cooperate together that all have their own slightly differing mandates, have different procedures, different ways of looking at things. Um, we're trying to mesh funding together. Uh, and so it's, um, 
It's interesting. Uh, um, but so bringing these together, to, if you like Chatham House rule style, to thrash out stuff behind closed doors, and then to try and bring that to the beneficiaries, try and agree on some ways forward. Um, for, I give you an example. We have the fact that um, the EC insists that if you're they're co-financing um, a, a project that has an environmental impact, that the IFI must apply the full uh, environmental impact analysis, even in the cases where the countries of the region haven't fully transposed the ACQ or haven't got the institutions in place. So you have a bit of an Alice in Wonderland situation. You know how do, you know you must do it, but how do you do it if you're missing the gaps? But there have been some ways under in the new member states there were obviously these kind of gaps. So we're trying to share that experience in the Western Balkans so that because a lot of projects are really held up because of this. We're cooperating with all the regional sectoral organisations in the region and because I suppose with my background in the Stability Pact I, I really feel passionate about this because we're only there for a few years. We absolutely must transfer um, knowledge, know-how, whatever you want, best practice to these sectoral organisations uh, who will be there for, for the long haul. I'm looking at the Energy Community Secretariat in, in Vienna. Um, there is a South East Europe Transport Observatory in Belgrade. That's based on an MOU among the countries. But hopefully there will be a there is a Transport Community Treaty similar to the energy one. It has all been negotiated. All the technical work is done. It's being held up at the moment, of course, because there's disagreement as to how Serbia or how excuse me how Kosovo uh, can sign. Um, and you know, the, the, but that will come through. We hope uh, eventually. And obviously the RCC, the successor of the Stability Pact. We do a, we're doing a lot of uh, focus on information, uh, just simple, not, no, no rocket science here, simple communicating um, information and getting uh, information flows going. And we have uh, the joy of doing a website. It's the www.wbif.eu. I have it at the end there. And on that, we have all information about the WBIF. Our brief is funny. It's to do the WBIF and beyond. So because the EC and the IFIs cooperate in a lot of places, not just under this WBIF. So you'll find there a lot of reports. We have a library, we're developing a library. So again, anyone doing research, I think you could find this an interesting place uh, to go. And then we provide policy and strategy inputs into the various meetings, for example, on the steering committee. We were going to do something on the social sector uh, this year. Um, and then, um, just in terms of moving forward, uh, as Peter said, I mean, given that the getting private sector into the Western Balkans is a, is a, has always been a challenge and will continue to be a challenge and is exacerbated by the crisis, there is uh, clearly uh, the role of official uh, or public sector financing is even more important. And um, the Commission, as part of its overall budget negotiations, has put a, forward a proposal on its external assistance. It put it forward in December um, for nine geographic and thematic instruments and one horizontal uh, regulation. As you can see there, they're looking at, they've requested, I hasten to add this is a request because I think the blood on the walls debate about the EU budget has yet to, to happen. Um, but they're looking at 14.1 billion for the enlargement policy. Now, please note that also includes Turkey and Iceland, although I suspect Turkey might take a bit more than Iceland. Um, whoops, I hit this the wrong way. Yes. These are the instruments, the overall external financing instruments that the uh, EC wants to use go going forward. And as you can see, there's quite a bit there. The countries of the Western Balkans would also be able to avail of the democracy, human rights, hopefully don't need the instrument for stability, and uh, nuclear safety, although there isn't much of that in the region. But the instrument for pre-accession, the yellow one there, is, is the main one uh, for the region. And the EC has conducted quite an extensive consultation process in looking at how they should adapt EPA. I mean, they now have the experience of implementing it since 2007. Um, and they did huge consultations in the region and with external partners and within the EC and with the member states. So they are trying to tie assistance much closer to, to reform. To, and they're also trying to introduce a, a kind of a, a reward system. You know, reforms will equal more assistance. Now, this still has to be debated by the EU member states, by the European Parliament. Let's see how it goes forward. But there is a clear uh, intention to do this. Um, also, moving away from, in some cases, EPA as the instrument for pre-accession was interpreted quite narrowly as assistance for transposing the acquis. 
you know, all 80,000 pages of it, and you're putting that onto the law books, and that was it. That was your pre-accession. And now there's this realisation that to meet the Copenhagen criteria, you need socio-economic development. And it's not just transposing the acquis, it's implementing the acquis. So um, that, that's coming in there, into attention to socio-economic development. And then trying to get stronger ownership of the reform agenda, not just because we have to tick the box for Brussels, but that this is, this is actually needed. In what they're calling the novelties, um, <laughs> it must be a novelty if you're deep in the bowels of the earth of the Charlemagne building, but um, more coherent and strategic approach. A lot of the programming has been annual programming on a project by project basis. Um, so moving to multi-annual planning and also going to a sector-based approach rather than individual, really trying to genuinely have sector-based approach. They have to see how they're going to get there. This is going to take a couple of years to do, but they're going to try and start now as to how they're going to plan on that. And also not going to have this division between the components. That's the Commission proposal for the moment, that you don't, it's not depend, your country's access to finance is not dependent on your candidate status, it's dependent on your needs uh, and your, your willingness to reform and your willingness to progress and, and move forward. Uh, Result-oriented, well, everything is supposed to be result-orientated. They are talking about doing better measurement, rewarding performance, and allegedly simplified implementation. Um, Court of Auditors notwithstanding. Um, I think I should be nearly there. The timeline, uh, okay, it has been uh, submitted uh, in December, as I say. The discussions are, are going on. In parallel, the DG Enlargement are drafting the implementation regulation. This would be important for any consultancy companies looking at uh, doing work under this. And um, the strategic documents, and this is where we, ha we will possibly be playing a small role on from the regional perspective, looking at these overall sectoral strategies um, which, which are needed. And, oops, no, oh, there we go, oops, I'm taking you away. That is the, the website, uh, I invite you to go and look there and I'd also be very happy to, to answer any questions or to talk to uh, you separately about that.